All right. So I was trying to think about the order that I wanted to talk about things tonight. And um, I think we'll start with the textbook. And when I'm teaching a new class, the first thing I do is I order um, like supplemental readings that I can read. Um, unfortunately, I only got this like three days before it started, so I couldn't read them in advance. But um, so I have a lot of journal articles that I'm going to read on my own. And then I read through the textbook and the book I added, The Body Keeps Score. And I basically write notes in the book as I read things that I'd like to talk about, but mainly if the book talks about something and it reminds me of something else, like this theory reminds me of two or three other theories, then I just make notes on it so that um, I can talk about it when the, when the time comes in the lecture. First of all, what what's the feeling about the textbook? Um, I didn't choose it, but you know, uh, I looked at them all. Um, this is actually the most unique textbook of the three primary ones available because uh, this is the textbook that really brings up uh, a fairly new uh, theory. And uh, these authors didn't develop the theory, but... Uh, they really enhanced it quite a bit. So, you know, RCT, uh, Relational Cultural Theory, um, was originally developed by Gene Baker Miller, but um, I guess Thelma Duffy and Shane Haberstroh uh, picked this up and they really like it. Um, so they're really basing the first chapters on, on this theory. The other crises books, crisis trauma, um, really go with more traditional theories. Um, in the future, I'll probably combine them a little bit, but I know enough about the normal theories that I can add them as we go through this, this theory that they're talking about. So I will add the additional theories in the lectures for you, but I thought we'd first go through the first two chapters in the textbook. I'm going to highlight things that I think are important, give you a little further explanation, add a couple other theories that are similar. I also have an exercise for you that's kind of fun. Um, and then after the break, uh, we'll talk about The Body Keeps the Score. And uh, I really like that book. Um, I'm glad I added it. So uh, any comments on the textbook in general? Was it easy to read? Did you find it difficult to read? Any thoughts on it? Oh, I liked it. I, I've already underlined lots of things from it. So it was easy to read, had a lot of um, excellent points. Yeah. And it was modern. <laughs> yeah, it was more modern. I think it incorporates some of the more modern theories like feminism and also includes some of the classics like person-centered. So it's a nice mix. Yeah. I don't think they give those theories enough credit, but I think that, you know, I know they drew from those theories, but maybe they need to give them a little more credit. So um, when in the very first uh, paragraph, it talks about critical incidents and traumatic events. And, um, critical incidents are often referred to as crises. Um, but crises and crisis and trauma are very different. Um, so 
let me, I did underline the definitions just because they had them, uh, but I'm also going to talk about them. So crisis is often an immediate, unpredictable event that occurs in people's lives, like a threatening medical diagnosis, uh, miscarriage, undergoing a divorce. It could overwhelm the ways that they naturally cope. People can experience crises as individuals or as part of a group, community, or other, other connected systems. So um, the first thing is a person can have a crisis that does not result in trauma. So, um, you know, I also see crisis as an event. Whereas I see trauma as an emotional result. Um, so there are differences. People tend to use the word crisis and trauma interchangeably, but, but they're really not. Um, crisis can result in trauma, but it doesn't always result in trauma. Sometimes we can overcome a crisis or we can process a crisis and it doesn't result in trauma. Trauma is a much more serious result of a crisis. So um, I think that crises can exacerbate emotional conditions that we're already experiencing. So let's just say um, you know, maybe we've had uh, a traumatic experience in the past. Maybe we've experienced trauma. If we have a crisis, even if it's 10 years after trauma, it could exacerbate some of the symptomology that we had with the trauma. It, maybe we don't maybe we never experience trauma, but there's a crisis and we're going through multiple life stressors at that time. So those stressors each result in their own emotions, but they can be amplified because of the current crises. They can build upon each other and they may become more uh, overwhelming than they would each be on their own. So combined emotions can be uh, you know, exacerbated uh, due to a crisis or due to a number of different uh, events that we're experiencing at the same time. So they can also interfere, crises can interfere with a person's ability to handle normal life. So if you can imagine a divorce or, um, you know, something like that, that not only becomes very emotional, but it becomes stressful and time consuming. And um, it affects all areas of our life functioning. It also affects our emotions and uh, something that might normally be a pleasurable event, going out to eat with our friends. We may be preoccupied with some of the negative thought processes and emotions with that other crisis. So uh, we may not be able to think as clearly as we normally would at our jobs because our minds are on the crisis. So it may affect the way we're able to function in our normal lives as well. So trauma can result from a very serious crisis or critical event, but it doesn't have to. But trauma itself is serious. Um, a crisis may be momentary and then it's over, but trauma persists. So. Like I said, trauma is a more severe emotional reaction to an event, and it involves emotional, mental, and physical response 
to a powerfully negative experience or a series of situations in which people perceived that they or a loved one experienced serious psychological, physical, or emotional harm. I'd like to add a few other things to that definition. There is often a feeling of helplessness involved in the situation, uh, in that serious experience. Um, one of the, the things that I would like to point out is that you'll see it all through the textbook, but the organization uh, SAMHSA, which stands for Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, um, is often uh, quoted and referred to as a result of trauma or crisis. Um, and uh, one of my friends is rewriting the uh, some of the um, books for SAMHSA, Mark Lepore. Um, he had a lot of experience with trauma crisis, did his dissertation on, uh, on, uh, on uh, trauma. So um, if you think about it, it could be a broad range of experiences. We often think of a few specific ones, but it could be uh, violence, sexual assault, abuse, neglect, disaster, terrorism, war, a chronic abuse, abandonment, a tragic loss of a loved one. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that um, that is just a broad range of examples. Um, Trauma could result from one serious incident or repeated incidents. Um, it can affect uh, our developmental uh, lifespan, our development along the lifespan, depending on what age this occurred. Um, so, uh, as we think about this, I think this book touches on some of the things that the body keeps the score touches upon as well. I think um, it talks a little bit about how it can affect us physically, but the textbook primarily focuses on um, our psychological uh, response to trauma. Um, it does talk about some things that are usually included in the diagnosis of PTSD, like possibility of flashbacks, debilitating symptoms, nightmares, physical, emotional, spiritual, social concerns, um, can result in acute anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, a combination of all of those things. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, uh, I think we have an entire class on trauma-informed care, um, but they just touch upon that in the first chapter. And then they move on to basically RCT, uh, at relational cultural theory and, um, as I read more about this, uh, you know, relationship is really the key word in the title of that theory. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that uh, it was written by uh, Jean Baker Miller um, in her book, Toward a New Psychology of Women. I think... Um, it was primarily focused on women in the beginning, but as time went on, uh, just like feminist theory, and now it can include anybody, children, males, females, any gender identity, um, you know, so it's become 
much more broad in its focus. Um, as we move through this, I think it, it did place it in context that prior to, I would say early on, um, uh, it gives references to like, you know, 1991, but I'm thinking even before that, um, that there were a lot of misdiagnoses, especially with women, uh, and they were showing a lot of symptomology. And, you know, in a diagnosis, many diagnoses have symptomology that can overlap. So a lot of women who would experience trauma, especially abuse or rape or something like that, um, and they didn't talk about it, and yet they displayed the symptomology, they were often misdiagnosed uh, because of that symptomology when it should have been diagnosed as some type of trauma like PTSD, or, um, you know, anxiety, depression resulting from trauma. Uh, but that was an often overlooked um, aspect uh, of women's psychological health. And uh, today, you know, the numbers are so high um, when we're talking about you know, women who have experienced trauma and children who have experienced trauma. Uh, we often don't even want to think about those numbers because the percentages are really so high. I find it, I find it quite disturbing. Um, moving on from that, they do talk about power structures and um, they talk about power with and power over. Power over um, is really not helpful, uh, whereas power with is shared power, and that's, that's the more positive one. Um, and one of the things that I really like about this theory that they started getting into is they call it protective disconnecting. It's a concept, um, but as far as I can tell, it's rooted in a combination of Murray Bowen's family system theory and uh, how people handle dysfunctional relationships. And they combine that with uh, Fritz Perl's Gestalt theory and um, the layers of the personality. So if you put those two together, you kind of get this idea of protective disconnecting, but they've refined it quite a bit and they focus just on crisis and trauma. But let's see how they how they do that. So um, for individuals own protection, if they've experienced some type of trauma, they may feel as though they cannot be authentic in a relationship, a situation, a system like a, a job system, a family system, something like that, work system, environment. Um, an environmental system. Uh, and so they change themselves or are not fully authentic in order to protect themselves from a negative response. Now that negative response from others would be anything from being judged or not accepted or feeling unheard or being criticized or, you know, ending the relationship, whatever that relationship might be. And so um, they substitute other attributes for their authentic attributes that they feel will be more accepted. 
Um, so, um, you know, uh, when we think about, um, when we think about first uh, Gestalt theory, you know, um, and they have the layers of personality. And the first layer is the phony layer, okay? And one of our first, uh, our first uh, orders as uh, um, goals as a, a therapist is to help clients become aware that they aren't actually being authentic. And, and what's happening is that it's almost like they're wearing a mask. And if they wear that mask, they feel safe behind the mask. They feel as though other people will accept them. They are who other people want them to be. And um, there's often this saying, in fact, when Carl Rogers was talking to Gloria in their famous um, session, uh, one of the things Carl Rogers said, it's almost as if I really knew you that I wouldn't accept you for who you truly are. And that's the fear. If somebody really knows somebody that they wouldn't be accepted for who they are. So then we add a little bit of like the very root of this would be person-centered. And it's kind of like unconditional positive regard and acceptance versus conditional positive regard and acceptance. So unconditional acceptance is that I'm going to accept you, my client, for whoever you are, I'm not going to judge you, and uh, you are who you are, and I'm going to accept you as that individual, whoever that might be. Um, but conditional acceptance has a whole variety of other aspects. Um, people may feel as though they have to look a certain way or act a certain way or not say certain things or not believe certain things or, you know, put on a mask or a facade so that if I'm this person, then other people will accept me and like me. And eventually they're so used, like... Uh, as they move through their developmental stages, they keep adding on, you know, pieces of this mask until they may even believe that this is who I am. But in reality, that's the person that they show other people. And it's not who they really are. If they were by themselves, they might enjoy other things. They might fear sharing those other things or saying those other things or could be as simple as not dressing a certain way. Um, but uh, what happens with trauma is that when somebody experiences trauma, it accentuates that fear of rejection and being re-traumatized. And uh, they disconnect more easily, more quickly. Um, they wear more of a mask. They are less authentic. Um, and, uh, and they may fear rejection, judgment, new traumatization, all of this results in a lack of trust in relationships. And so it's more difficult to build a trusting relationship. It's very difficult to build a trusting relationship if 
both people in that relationship are not authentic with one another because you're really beginning to trust somebody who wears a mask. And eventually, you're going to have to remove that mask and the other person is going to have to meet the authentic you. And then you have to realize that, oh, well, that wasn't the real you that I was getting to know. So the first goal in Gestalt therapy is to help clients to realize that they're wearing this mask. It's called the phony stage, but you know, it's the inauthentic stage. It's the second uh, goal of Gestalt therapy is to help clients to understand why they are wearing the mask. And the reason they wear that mask is because of fear. It's fear of judgment and rejection. So they call that the phobic stage because phobic means fearful. The third stage is called the impasse stage. And the impasse stage is that stage where people get stuck. For some reason, people get stuck. Perhaps they've been rejected and they didn't want to experience those feelings of rejection again. In this case, in this textbook, it's more serious than that. It's not just rejection, it's trauma. So trauma is, you know, much more uh, dangerous than rejection. Um, but that's where they get stuck. Uh, so what I'd like you to do is I want you to try a uh, I want you to try an activity. And you don't have to write down or draw anything you don't feel comfortable sharing because I'd like you to upload these as part of your discussion board and talk about them yourself. You're going to take your time doing this. I'm going to stop the recording to give you time to actually create these. And then we're going to talk about them in class, but you can also upload them to the discussion board. So the first thing I'd like you to do is take like a piece of notebook paper or any paper and draw an oval. And that's your face. Okay, It doesn't have to be perfect. And at the top, this is what you show other people. This is the inauthentic you. This is the phony you. And so I want you to be creative. You can write words on it. You can draw pictures on it. You can use colors if you have them. Um, you can make mistakes, but I want you to write down things about yourself that you add to yourself or change so that other people will accept you or so that work will accept you or so that your clients might accept you so that I might accept you in class. What are the things that maybe aren't the real you? Things so relationships of all different kinds might accept you. How about something that you added or changed about yourself so that you accept yourself? Now, the second thing, I want you to take another piece of paper, do the same thing, draw an oval on it, and I want you to write authentic at the top. This is the part that other people may not see, the part other people may not know about, but it's the real you. Maybe you love singing, but you sing totally out of tune. Maybe you're embarrassed about something, but hey, this is who I am. 
maybe you like certain things. Maybe you really want to dress a certain way, but you you feel like other people might reject you. Maybe you're you want to say certain things, but you think other people won't accept you if you said them. Maybe you have certain beliefs. Maybe you want to accept the real you, but you find that difficult. Um, I, I'll give you a personal example. I had a hard time accepting myself if I wasn't perfect. Perfect's impossible, but you know what I mean, being a perfectionist. All right, and then I just want you to compare the two and you can take a phone picture of them and upload them to the your computer in the discussion box. So I'm going to stop recording now and I'm going to give you a little time to work on this. Okay, so whether you're completed or not, you can work on more later. Um, but uh, not everybody has to share them in class, but I would like you to upload them to the discussion board. But is there anybody who would like to share them in class and tell us, tell us about them? Okay, Un unmute Barbara, and I'm going to have you face the class. Okay, so um, this is what other people see, and it's someone who always says the right things, friendly, happy, helpful, strong, um, smiling, even though disaster could be going on inside. So all this stuff kind of chokes out the real person. Um, what's authentic? is someone who's quiet, shy, um, very creative, isolated, um, older, quiet, mature, and fearful. So those are my two. Great, thanks. Anybody else wanna share? Go ahead. Anybody online want to share? I can share mine. Um, I did, I, well, since I'm an art therapy person, I, I just want to write to my paints. Um, oh. So I might have to unblur. You might see my messy bedroom. That's part of my authentic self. <laughs> Let's see. Unblur my background. There we go. Okay. Um, so my mask I did as like a, a very similar to what Barbara, uh, kind of that like very calm, confident. Um, I feel like I am easy. Like I, I'm a people person. I, it's easy to make friends. I'm adventurous. Um, I'm very goal oriented, high achieving. So that comes off, um, very much so. Um, but authentically, I feel like I spend a lot of time in hibernation, in self-reflection. And so like I symbolize that with like majority of my picture focusing on the roots underneath, because I spend a lot of times in that like self-reflection um, on the confidence and self-love and boundaries and relationships and um, that healing aspect. Um so, and that's like what a lot of people don't see. Um, they just see the cool, calm, collected. Maybe not the cool part, but the calm part. Great. And that's nice art. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we'll get to see everybody else's. And you could even keep keep working on it while I'm talking. I won't be offended. So Are we supposed to draw an actual face? Or are we supposed to like write stuff? Well, like... Like I, I drew like the outline of the face and I might draw eyes and a mouth, but like on my authentic self, maybe I'm not happy all the time. So I would draw a frown, a frown you know, sometimes. Uh, I, just, but, I like, 
I wrote things like I didn't. Yeah, you honestly. could write all over it. You could draw symbols. Okay. You know, it's whatever you want to do. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're open. All right. So let's talk a little more about, about the theory. And so we've talked about this whole concept um, of disconnecting as kind of a, a coping mechanism for self-protection emotionally and even physically. Um, so uh, what are we going to do about this as counselors? And I know it gets into this more later on, but I underlined a, a few things and it says, uh, think for a minute to a time when you experienced an event that was outside of your control, an experience that may have felt like a punch in the stomach or an unexpected term of events that some would consider debilitating. Imagine there was a counselor present. What would the counselor say or do to have you experience safety or a feeling of safety at that moment? How would a therapist help you to feel heard and safe? Because sometimes people, even though you're in a counseling session and it's a safe environment, they may emotionally feel these things if they're talking about trauma or crisis. Any ideas? What might help them to feel safe emotionally? Just I empathic listening, like active listening. Yeah, I, I go, yeah, go with go with the empath empathy. Yeah. So um so yeah, it's really if you want others to be the Dalai Lama said, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. But honestly, a lot of times uh, counselors make a mistake and they try to problem solve a person who's experiencing an unsafe moment or crises or emotional distress. And probably the most valuable thing you can do is be present, practice empathy, allow them to feel as though they are heard. And you can do that by using all those basic Rogerian person-centered skills of reflection and paraphrasing and uh, you could even be authentic yourself. I mean, there's times when I've been a therapist in a session when I've cried with a client. That's okay. Um, you know, they know they touched you in some way emotionally. Uh, I usually do not shift the focus from the client. I keep the focus on the client. Like if a client experienced something and they seem a bit distressed, I don't start self-disclosing and say, oh, I went through something similar. That shifts the focus from the client to me. I want the focus to remain on the client and I want to remain present with the client when these things occur. One of the things it says, for example, the immediate uh, aftermath of a trauma or crisis, counselors attend to a person's loss of control, a desire for safety, and their basic needs. So that reminded me of being a counselor in the Red Cross. The first thing we really have to do with a client, especially if we're working at a crisis center, is we do have to help them to be in a real reality safe place. We do have to make sure that we are meeting their immediate needs uh, physically and emotionally. Um, 
and uh, and they probably did feel a loss of control in whatever experience they just went through. And we want to help them to feel as though they have regained some sense of control, at least in that moment. Um, so safety, we're going to be learning about how to do an assessment. Um, and, uh, and because they're all going to need basic things, one of the first things that uh, the Red Cross does is even if a client's been through maybe a fire in their home, we still give them a blanket. Why do you think we give them a blanket? It's one of the first things we always do. Because it's comforting. Yeah, it's comforting. Yeah. And um, my wife is in an organization where um, they send blankets to people who have experienced crisis or trauma. Um, and uh, it's really um, for for a feeling of comfort and safety. And, um, you know, uh, it seems like a simple thing. Um, the other thing we do is the first thing, a lot of crises happen at night. And the first thing an individual is thinking about beyond their physical safety is where am I going to go? And so we either open a shelter or we find a hotel for them. So at least they have three days where until they can organize a place to go and we can do it longer, but that's usually what it is. So those, in, it's impossible to work on any type of counseling content until those basic Maslow needs are being met because, uh, you know, that's what they're thinking about first, food, shelter, clothing, safety. Yeah. Once they have those, at least in a temporary control, then we can move on and I can address how are you doing emotionally? What's going on with you there? Um, so one of the things uh, my friend Mark uh, wrote about in his uh, dissertation was, um, and this was uh, near 9-11, uh, but he wrote about vicarious or secondary trauma. And as counselors, we have to be aware of this. As we listen to the experiences of our clients, we also are experiencing emotions as we hear these stories. I rarely take things home with me from, from counseling, but I heard a couple stories that I dreamt about for months. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, we have to be aware of um, the effect that our clients' emotional stories that they share with us have on us. And that's why uh, we are going to have a whole class on dealing with our own self-care and well-being. We're going to talk about critical incident stress debriefing after crises. We're going to talk about um, how uh, not to hold on to the emotions that we experience empathically with clients. Um, and how not to take them home with us or fixate on them. And, uh, you know, another thing that this chapter ended with, and I've had these experiences, was, um, you know, if it is a large crisis and it results in a lot of people's trauma, like, you know, 9-11, 
the World Trade Centers, things like that. Um, there is a lot of media now. Uh, people are hearing things on Facebook before the, they're on the news, and they may be correct or they may not be correct. They could just be gossip. Um, and we're trying to help people at the event wade through things that are on social media or the news. It also goes the other way. All of their families are watching the news and looking at social media, and they're worried about the individuals that we're with at the event. And um, a lot of times, uh, cell phones will fail, and they can't contact each other, or the cell phone will be lost in the event, whether it's a fire or something like that. And so, you know, I remember the emotions when my brother was living in New York City and there was the World Trade Center, uh, you know, uh, disaster. And, um, you know, we were worried for hours until he was able to contact us. And, uh, and you know, so we have to take that into consideration. One of the the biggest things that we can do as helpers is to find lines of communication so that at least they can let family know that they are safe. Um, and that alleviates not only worry on the family's part, but you know, they don't want their families to be worried either. So that's one thing that is really on their minds. So um, let's see. Um, they do talk a little bit about, they give an, a case example of suicide. Um, a lot of people think that individuals who attempt or commit suicide want to die. But that's really not the case. Um, Suicide is usually a last resort to escape emotional or physical pain that they have not been able to resolve by other means. So um, it, if you kind of reframe your view of suicide that way, you know, it's really a reaction to emotional or physical pain that they can't handle any longer. Um, let's see. That's chapter one. Chapter two doesn't have quite as much content that I want to talk about, but it, it starts getting into the counseling relationship. And in this, uh, with this theory, the counseling relationship is the most important thing, just like um, person-centered. Uh, when they talk about the counseling relationship, it really reminds me a lot of what Martin Buber wrote about the I and thou experience. We both enter into a relationship with whoever we meet, and we have an experience with that other person and we're both changed by that experience in some way, by that interaction. And I'm hoping that as a result of a counseling experience, we are both changed in a positive way. Allowing that to occur, we have to be mindful of it. We have to be present. We have to be open to the experience and to other whoever we're with, and uh, and we have to use all of those basic Rogerian skills uh, of being present and showing empathy and being non-judgmental and being genuine ourselves. As we go through this exercise with the masks, I think the ultimate thing is, are we our genuine selves with our clients? As we learn to be our genuine selves with our clients, we also learn to be more genuine with everybody 
It changes us. It helps us to remove those inauthentic masks. And it helps us to become our authentic selves in all areas of our life and in all relationships. Um, so when it talks about relational images, it made me think about irrational thoughts, cognitive behavioral therapy, and REBT, rational emotive. Um, and uh, there's so much negative self-talk that the average person already carries with them because of the judgment of others. And um, it, but if a human being experiences trauma, that negative self-talk is often exaggerated as well. And, um, and that negative self-talk, if you really get deep enough into that, it all has to do with, am I good enough? Good enough for what? Good enough to be loved and accepted. And we're often worried about conditional love and acceptance rather than believing that we truly deserve unconditional love and acceptance for who we truly are. Um, relational responsiveness, being authentic ourselves and in reaction to whatever the client shares with us, it's okay to have an authentic response. I never believed that counselors should maintain a deadpan emotion, you know. It's okay to express emotion with clients, as long as it's genuine. It shows that we care. Um, and, uh, and often, you know, I, I would say, honestly, that I've grown just as much from my experience with my clients as they've grown from their experience with me. I see a little bit of myself in every one of my mm -hmm. clients and I can learn about myself from that experience with my clients. We're all human beings. Um, the only thing I would disagree with um, is when they talk about the grieving aspect of some trauma that results in the loss of a loved one. And I would say that people really do need grief and loss therapy, and it's usually a complicated grieving. So I don't think every theory works with every situation. You can use this theory, but they would also need a genuine grief and loss therapy as well. And I think they neglected to include that. Maybe they'll include it later in the book. They have what's called empathic failures. And, you know, I like this, this author's examples of her own failures because I've made a lot of mistakes when I'm talking with clients. And nine times out of 10, they'll tell me but sometimes I'll realize that mm, I don't think that got the reaction I had meant. And so then I usually use clarification. I say, I just want to make sure that I'm on the right track here. You know, so I check in with the client and I ask for their, you know, uh, genuine reaction. I can tell you one example. I was with the young girl, I think she was like eight and uh, she had experienced um, a trauma, um, a member of her family. Uh, when the police came to arrest them, uh, they held her at gunpoint and used her as a hostage. And she felt as though even though this was a loved one, that her life was in danger and it probably might have been. Um, and uh, she 
felt so unsafe that she would not enter my play therapy room. And so I let her sit in the hall and I would play in the room in front of the door. And sometimes I'd put on a puppet show or sometimes I'd play with the sand and I'd just talk with her and she wouldn't respond. And, but she'd sit and watch me. She was curious, you know, and sometimes I would hand her something that she could play with out in the hall while I was playing in the playroom. And eventually she came in the playroom and wouldn't talk and started playing. And then one day, you know, I think it was kind of like a breakthrough. She trusted me enough and she told me what happened. And I thought I had a very empathic response. I said, I'm so sorry that happened, but thank you for sharing your story with me. I thought that was a good response. And she says, no, it wasn't a story. It was true. So then I felt like, oh, man. And, uh, you know, then I had to tell her, no, some stories are make-believe and other stories are true. And I believe you. But, um, you know, I'm like, you never know how, how people are going to understand or respond to what you say. All right, well, we're going to stop with the textbook and then we're going to take we're going to take a break. It's uh, a little before quarter after. Come back in 10 minutes, 25 after. And then we'll talk about the body keeps the score.